Hello everyone, my name is Derek. Today I'm going to talk about neural subdivision. And this is a joint work with Vladimir Kim, Siddharth Chachadri, Noam Eigerman, and Alec Jacobson. So subdivision is a widely used technique in 3D modeling. So starting from a coarse mesh on the left, subdivision recursively refines the mesh into a smooth and high resolution one. And roughly speaking, classic subdivision consists of two steps. The first step is to upsample the geometry. And for example, in loop subdivision, we split each triangle into four small ones. And the next step is to update the vertex positions using some predefined rules. And in loop subdivision, this will be a weighted average between neighboring vertices. And if we recursively apply these two steps, we will be able to obtain a smooth and high resolution shape. And classic subdivision often assumes the underlying geometry to be smooth. Therefore, without a lot of manual efforts, we can easily create a smooth shape out of it. But if our target geometry is like this complicated one with a lot of sharp creases, then a lot of manual efforts is required. And the motivation of our work is to replace such a manual effort with a machine learning model. We want the network to learn how to subdivide the mesh differently for different parts. And in this example, we show that this allows us to better preserve the features of this gorilla mesh. So how can we train such a subdivision network? And this requires to talk about the training data, the net network design. And once we have an output, we need to define a loss function j that measures the quality of the output mesh. And in this paper, we are going to address all of them. And this belongs to the recent trend of geometric deep learning. And this is a research field where we try to apply machine learning models to geometric data. And recently, people have studied many different representations, such as voxels, point clouds, or implicit functions. However, in this paper, we are not going to work on these representations, and instead, we focus on triangle meshes. And in the rest of the talk, I will be talking about some key ideas that allows us to handle irregular discretizations and make the network invariant to rigid motions. In our experiment, we notice that our network is extremely data efficient. We only need a single training shape, and we are able to generalize to subdivide shapes that do not exist in the training. First, let's talk about the training data and the loss function. And this is where we make the network robust to different triangulations. Basically, our goal is that given the same horse with a bunch of different triangulations, we want the network to subdivide them into a similar looking high resolution horse. And we achieve this using a randomized edge decimation. So given a fine mesh in green, we randomly simplified it into many different coarse meshes, and this many pairs of high resolution and low resolution meshes are our training data. And the reason of using such a randomized algorithm is because we want to provide the network with a lot of different coarse triangulations so that you can learn how to be robust to that. And these coarse meshes will be the input to our network. And now the question becomes, how can we design a suitable loss function to measure the difference between the output and the ground truth? A popular choice is so-called the chamfer distance. And intuitively, chamfer distance perceives the two meshes as two sets of points. And then it measures the difference using the closest point. But it is not hard to imagine that if we simply minimize this chamfer distance, we may get an output mesh with incorrect connectivity. And that is because chamfer distance basically ignores the connectivity of the mesh. And therefore, we propose to define the loss function using a bijective map. So given the vertex on the output mesh, we follow the bijective map f to obtain its corresponding location on the ground truth mesh. And notice that since this map is bijective, so a vertex on the left could be mapped to the middle of a triangle on the right. And once we obtain these correspondences, 
we can then simply define the loss function as the squared L2 differs. But how can we compute such a bijective map? And we split this problem into two subproblems. The first one is to figure out the mapping between the ground truth and the input, which comes from a sequence of edge decimation. And the second one is to figure out the map between the input and the output subdivided mesh. And luckily, the map on the left is well defined because it comes from a subdivision process, and therefore, now the question becomes, how can we compute such a mapping on the right? So in order to solve the problem, we propose a technique called successive self-parameterization. And here we consider a sequence of edge collapses from the left to the right. And our goal is to compute the full mapping between level L and level 0. Instead of computing this map directly, we split it into a bunch of small ones, and we focus our computation on the map between a single edge collapse. And the reason we do this is because once we can figure this out, we will be able to obtain the full map simply using composition. And here is a warm-up example. We consider how to compute the map before and after a single edge collapse. So given the point here, how can we compute its corresponding location after the collapse? And the answer is very trivial. We can simply compute its barycentric coordinate and copy it to the mesh on the right, and then we are able to obtain its corresponding location. And this process is pretty straightforward because this part of the mesh remains fixed, but if I hand you a point at this location, it is now unclear how can we obtain its corresponding location because the map in this region gets changed. So now let's focus on how to compute the map within the edge one ring. And the key observation is that although the interior part changed, the boundaries of these two patches remain the same. So we base on this observation to simultaneously flatten these two patches to 2D with a consistent boundary curve. And this allows us to overlay these two parameterizations into a consistent one. So given a point on the patch after the collapse, we can use its barycentric coordinate to figure out its 2D location and use the overlay triangulation to figure out its barycentric coordinate before the collapse. And after that, we can use this to obtain its corresponding 3D location. And basically, this is how we compute the map before and after a single edge collapse. And we can then obtain the full map using composition. So here is a visualization of full map. We decimate the green mesh down to the gray one, and we visualize the triangulation of the gray mesh on top of the green one, showing on the right. And we use different colors to represent different triangles. And the self parameterization we just discussed is, is just some additional steps on top of standard edge decimation. And therefore, we can handle meshes with complicated topologies or with thin and sharp features. And once we obtain the mapping, we can simply follow this route to obtain the bijective map between the output and the ground truth so that we can define the loss function as the squared L2 difference. So now let's talk about the subdivision network. And here, we are going to handle two key challenges. First, we need to handle the irregular representation of the triangle mesh. And we will discuss how can we make the network invariant to region motions. So what do I mean irregular here? And to answer this, we need to compare it with images. Defining a machine learning model on images heavily relies on the regular grid structure. For example, if we want to define the image convolution, it relies on the fact that each pixel has a fixed number of neighbors. However, on triangle meshes, we don't have such a nice regular structure. For instance, if we want to generalize the idea of convolution to vertex neighbors, then we won't have a fixed number of neighbors. We also don't have a canonical ordering between them. Therefore, last year, Hanako and colleagues proposed to work on undirected edges. And to be more precise, they consider the convolution stencil to be the two adjacent faces associated to each edge. 
and this allows us to have a fixed input dimension because each flap only contains four neighboring vertices. But we still don't have a canonical ordering. So in this work, we propose to use half flaps. And this means two adjacent faces associated to each half edge. And similarly, this perspective allows us to have a fixed input dimension, but more importantly, we now have a canonical ordering between these vertices. And this allows us to define a local coordinate system for each half lap. And this will be the key to make the network invariant rigid motion. And imagine you have a vertex with some features stored using the global axis. And this feature could be something like the vertex location. So if we train a network to subdivide a cow at this location and test on a cow at a different location, then we may get the terrible output mesh like the one shown on the right. And one reason might be that the network just tries to memorize the vertex location, and since the location will change once we translate and rotate the model, so we can easily get such a bad output. But if we have a well-defined local frame, we can simply apply a coordinate transformation to this local axis. And then suddenly, the network will become invariant to rigid motion. And because no matter how we rotate and translate the mesh, the vertex feature stored using this local frame remains the same. So when we test our model on the same experiment, we are able to properly subdivide it. And it is worth mentioning that this rigid motion invariance is not just a nice property to have, it also allows us to use much simpler networks to achieve much better results. Because the network now does not need to spend a lot of resources to learn how to be robust to different orientations. And in our experiment, we simply use a shallow two-layer multi-layer perceptron, and it is already sufficient to generate all our results. So now let's take a step back to look at the entire subdivision network. And the main idea um, of this design is to borrow the wisdom of classic subdivision. And people usually call this algorithmic alignment. And this basically means that uh, we design the network according to the procedure of the classic methods. So in our case, we follow the idea of loop subdivision. We first upsample the mesh by splitting each triangle into four, and then we update the vertex positions. But instead of using a predefined rule, we replace it with a machine learning model. And that's to be more precise. So given a coarse mesh on the left, we split each triangle into fours. And this gives us a set of old vertices coming from the previous resolution and a set of new vertices we just inserted. And in order to move the old vertices, we consider a half flap starting from the center vertex as the input to our network. And we pass this half-life features through the network to get some displacement vector. And we simply copy this displacement and put it on the source vertex. Then we do exactly the same step for all the half-laps associated to this vertex. And in order to obtain the final displacement, we just do a simple average pooling. And similarly, in order to move the new vertices, we consider the two half flaps associated to this edge and do another average pooling to get a final displacement. And similar to classic subdivision, we can recursively uh, applying this two step to subdivide the mesh multiple iterations. So now we have all the ingredients we need. Let's have a brief summary. So our training data comes from a randomized edge decimation. And the reason of using randomized algorithm because it allows us to provide a network with um, training data that contains a lot of different uh, triangulations so that the network can learn how to be robust to that. And our network follows the wisdom of classic subdivision to recursively upsample the mesh and move the vertices. And we use half labs as the input to our network. And once we have an output, we use a bijective map to figure out the one-to-one -one correspondences between the output and the ground truth. 
so that we can simply define loss function as the squared L2 loss. So now let's take a look at some results. So here is an example of classic loop subdivision. And we can observe that classic methods may overly smooth the shape and remove important features. In contrast, our neural subdivision subdivides the mesh differently based on the appearance of local geometry. And this leads to a better feature preservation. And the surprising thing is that in this experiment, we only need a single shape in green during the training. Basically, we can train on a single object and it is already sufficient to generalize to unseen shapes such as this gorilla mesh. And our next experiment is on isometric deformations. We train our network on this canonical pose and we test on these poses that do not exist in training. And our methods can successfully subdivide them. And the next experiment is more challenging. We evaluate our methods on non-isometric deformations. So here, we train our network on this green chair and test on all these green meshes. And our method is able to generalize to subdivide all these meshes. And the fact that we only require a single shape during the training allows us to do stylized subdivision. So basically, the subdivision results will depend on the style of the training data you use. In this example, we train this on a nice and smooth elephant, so we end up getting a nice and smooth chair out of it. In this example, we train on a mechanical object with sharp features, and we can see that the edges on the coarse mesh are preserved after the subdivision. And here is a more interesting example. We train the network on a sphere with constant curvature. And we can see that neural subdivision tries to reproduce these constant curvature patches on top of the chair. And we also tried uh, on a shape with bumpy and noisy texture. And we can see that after the subdivision, this texture appears. And although we have shown a lot of examples of single shape training, but for sure, we can train on multiple objects. In this example, we train on these uh, smooth shapes, so we can produce a nice and smooth Hilbert curve. In this example, we train on a bunch of mechanical objects, and so that we can turn this Hilbert curve into a spiky one. So now let's, let's talk about some limitations and future work. So neural subdivision is purely based on local geometry. And this means that it cannot capture the global semantics of the shape. For instance, if we use neural subdivision to subdivide the, the input mesh in the middle, then we won't be able to reproduce those semantic features such as the eyes and the nose of this dragon. And our method is invariant to rigid motions and robust to different triangulations. But we are not invariant to scaling. Basically, if you scale up and down the mesh, you will get different results. And this is also caused an issue of not converging to a smooth limit surface. And that is because when you subdivide a mesh many, many, many times, and you may get some triangles that is much smaller than the ones you see in the training data. Therefore, we may get noisy output such as this yellow cactus. And personally, we are very excited about this half-lap convolution because it allows us to have a fixed input dimension, a canonical ordering, and a well-defined local frame, which is very useful for gener generative tasks. But this is not perfect yet. We hope to improve this idea to meshes with boundaries or to other discrete representations such as polygon meshes. And we propose a self-parameterization methods purely for defining the loss function. But we believe this may also be useful for other applications such as subdivision remeshing. And neural subdivision is just one of the first generative models for discrete surfaces. And we also hope this method could inspire more mesh generative models in the future. And we thank all the funding agencies and thank you for your time.